of him, he would give us the nations. Amen? You said, ask and you will receive whatever you need. You said,
Your glory will fill the earth like water the sea. Yeah. You said. power come down this morning, God. Can you believe for a miracle today? Can you believe for some deliverance today for somebody else? Maybe you're okay and everything's cool in your world, but maybe it's time for you to believe for somebody else. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was on me. And he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life, then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattly sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones, listen, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves. 
and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I, the Lord, have done it, declares the Lord. You're here this morning and you look at your life and you see a valley of dry bones. You see wasted opportunity, you see failure, you see mistakes, your hope is gone, you feel like you've been cut off. But this morning, God says live. God says live. He's gonna open graves this morning and you're gonna come out, okay? And when you come out, when God begins to move, it makes a sound. So we're gonna make some sound this morning. Can we do that? All right.
Yes, Lord. Let's close our eyes. Just begin to worship right now, wherever you are. We're going to lift our hands and we're going to shout to God right now. God said live. God said Somebody come live. up here with me. God said live. God said live. I said God said live. God said live. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I said I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear. Oh, there's another miracle. I hear the sound. 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 All right. I hear the sound. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Moses had freed the Hebrews from slavery. And they were walking to safety. But there was a barrier. It was called the Red Sea. You remember that? Between the people and the promise, there was a barrier. And they were going to die. They were being chased and they were going to die. And it was impossible to get to the other side. It was impossible to get, who, who's listening to me? It was impossible to get to the other side. But he told Moses to lift his hands. And God said, move. God said, move. And the, the sea had to get out of the way of the Israelites. They had to move. It had to move. It could not, it could not block them anymore. Because when God says move, you move. When God says move, you move. Between Joshua and the Israelite army and their victory, there was a barrier. It was called the walls of Jericho. You remember that? And you could not get over them. And you could not go under them. You could not go through them. It was impossible. 
but they were obedient to God. And then God said, move. I said, God said, move. I said, God said, move. I said, God said, move. And the walls came down. You remember that from Sunday school? You remember when the walls came down? Because when God says move, you move. When God says move, you move. Some of y'all are blocking your own miracle this morning because you won't move when God says move. This is for somebody today. You won't move when God said move, okay? There was a paralyzed man who had four friends. And they took him to see Jesus, but Jesus was in a house full of people. They couldn't get in. So they dragged this guy up to the roof, and they dug a hole, and they dropped him down in front of Jesus. Who needs a friend like that this morning? Come on. Jesus looked at this man, and he said, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's not why they brought him there today, was it? To say your sins are forgiven, they were hoping he would say get up and go home, right? But Jesus knew that if this guy gets up and goes home, but his sins aren't forgiven, then it's no good, is it? And they asked, who's this guy think he is that he can forgive sins? And Jesus said, so you know, I have the authority to forgive sins. And he looked down at the guy and said, get up, take your mat and go home. And the guy got up and he took his mat and he went home. Because God said move. God said move. He had to do it. Who needs a move of God this morning? Me. I do. Hang on now. Hang on now. some things I know about God. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he wants to. That's right. Just as the man who was thrown on the bones of Elisha. If there's is there anything he can't do this morning, come on. Just as the stone that was rolled What happens when God says to move? I feel Him moving it now. I feel Him doing it now. I feel Him doing it now. Oh, if this is the sound of tide bones rattling, this is the pace make a dead man walk again. Open the grave. I'm gonna live, gonna live. Open the grave. Open the grave. Yeah, this is the sound of troubles that land. Yes. Yes, 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 Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Yeah, come on, give God a shout this morning. Yes, Lord. Give God a shout this morning. Somebody say, Yes, Lord. Woo. Yes, Lord. Yes Lord. yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Whatever you want to do, Lord, we believe. We believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we praise your name today. We glorify you, Jesus. We glorify. Well, let's lift high the name of Jesus this morning. Can we do that? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We glorify you this morning. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Oh, whatever you want to do. Oh, not going to run out of miracles and it 
Oh, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Somebody just say the name of Jesus with me one time. Jesus, 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 Jesus. How many know there's power in the name of Jesus? How many know there's freedom in the name of Jesus? How many know there's healing in the name of Jesus? There's chain-breaking power in the name of Jesus right now. We bless your name, Jesus. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your name. We thank you for your blood. Yes, Lord. Yes. Oh, we glorify you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We glorify you. We praise your name. What a mighty God we serve. He is a chain-breaking, mountain-moving God. I've seen him do it. I've seen him, I've seen him do it before. I've seen him do it in the lives of the people in this room. I've seen him do it over and over and over and over. Things that were impossible. Things that nobody believed could happen, and God just said yes and began to move. And he began to move. We thank you, Jesus. We glorify you. We thank you for your presence in this room today. Oh, he's here this morning. Bless your name. Oh, we bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. Let your will be done. Let your name be glorified. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Can somebody say amen this morning? Amen, amen. amen. Go and have a seat. continue our worship this morning through our tithes and offerings and uh, we just want to invite you to be a part of that and there's three easy ways you can give this morning whether it's on FOTN.org through our text mobile giving or through the envelope that's sitting in front of you and so uh, however you're giving we just invite you to be a part of our fellowship and to walk in obedience so let's go ahead and pray together as a church God, we thank you so much, Lord, that um, you woke us up and, and, and our name was in your thoughts, Lord. And so I pray, Father, that we would give back to you, not just in our finances, but in our time and our adoration and our worship, Father. And we thank you, Father, that, that you were there, that you were here right now, Lord. And so I pray that you would give us a desperation for more of you, Lord, and that um, we would taste and see that you are so good, God, and there's nothing this world can give us that we don't already find in you, Lord. And so I pray, Father, that with that in mind, um, we would freely and cheerfully and expectantly um, desire and crave to give back to you, God, because you're so worthy of it, Lord. And so we just want to um, bless your name, and we thank you for everything that you've set out to do in the service this morning and everything you've already done, God. We thank you for that sound of, of bringing dead things back to life, Lord. And so we ask that you would first start with our heart, start with our faith, start with our obedience, God. And we thank you for that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for joining us here today at Fellowship of the Nations. Here's some things we have coming up. The annual FOTN Family Barbecue is today. It's at the North Shore Rotary Pavilion immediately following the Sunday service. Tickets are only $5, so get your tickets today for a fun time of food, fellowship, and great music by Crossroads. Bring a dessert to share if you have a specialty. The annual Fall Festival is this Wednesday night from 6 to 8.30 p.m. and includes concessions, games, treats, a petting zoo, and a photo booth. If you're planning to host a game booth, please see Julia Gilmore at Kid Nation and be sure to invite your neighbors and friends to come and enjoy this safe holiday event. Have you gotten connected to a care group yet? Well, what are you waiting for? There's something for everyone, so come and join us Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock or start a group in your home during the week. We will equip you, so see Pastor Locke for more information.
Have you had a chance to check out the new missions wall in the West Fourier Hallway? Just go and look at how God is moving all over the world, and you are making a difference. Now everybody, go out and have a great week. said. Amen. amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? We're good? Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be back. I want to say a big thank you to Pastor Stephanie and Pastor Locke for uh, preaching two great messages. Good job. It was so good. So good. Anyway, they talk about how long I preach, but they can't talk about that anymore because they preached a long time. Anyway, I, but anyway, every bit of it was good. So welcome. If you're here for the first time, we greet you in the name of Jesus. We are a fellowship of the nations. We're just a, we're a Jesus church. That's it. We're all about Jesus. Amen. So uh, that's, that's all that we're concerned about is glorifying him. And uh, let's give a big old warm welcome to those who are watching our online congregation. Good morning, guys. We love you. Praying for you. And uh, anybody got the word? Word up. Man, I tell you what, I sang so hard a while ago. I hope I have a voice left. I'm just, uh, I'm almost out of breath. <laughs> yes. Anyway, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It is a lamp to my feet, a light into my path. I will hide His Word in my heart so that I might not sin against God. Holy Spirit, give me ears to hear and strength to obey in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I, uh, I think you saw last week, uh, Pastor Locke showed the, uh, <clears throat> the construction of our newest church, our church plant that is in, uh, in India, and uh, it, is, it is going up. And so uh, that'll, it's just exciting what God is doing. I mean, only God can do it, and we're just totally, totally excited about all of that. So uh, to God be the glory. Well, listen, today <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, something because one of the things that really blessed me in, um, in 2008, Hurricane Ike came through here, and uh, man, it ravaged our city, it ravaged these facilities, $1.6 million worth of damage here, and, uh, but it also ravaged my, my yard. Anybody have any problem with uh, their house or yard or anything like that? Well, one reason why Lisa and I, we love that, that lot that we we're, were on, it's about an acre and a half, in, uh, but it had huge oak trees. I mean, just massive. I mean, there were some, you know, we could stand with my hands, Spread out, we had two that were just, just massive, but they were just beautiful. A lot of acorns, deer would come at night in, they would, you know, just a beautiful place. Well, um, <clears throat> Hurricane Ike took out seven of them. And uh, I mean, around our house, we had trees all around it, but not one tree hit our house. I mean, it was just a miracle of God. So we rejoiced over the fact that our house wasn't damaged, but then we, uh, we were a little overwhelmed because we got seven huge oak trees, and what are we going to do with these things, and how do you get them out? And, uh, and so <clears throat> came back in, was looking at the situation, and along came one of our overseers, Luke Walters. He comes in from uh, Louisiana, and he had a couple of loggers 
these guys had the, not the little, you know, baby uh, chainsaws. They had these chainsaws of like, you know, three feet, you know, and they're all, run. I mean, they knew how to do it. They were climbing up the trees that I had left and trimming. I mean, they're hanging off and they're, I mean, just massive trees. Happening. It took them two days just to cut the trees up. And uh, for, but what he said is, hey, I'm here. I was, I'm here. I'm in time of need. I'm here. And uh, what a blessing. And it took literally a whole week to burn that. We had our, uh, one of our neighbors, it was Mr. Coleman. He would come with his tractor. And he would just push all of those logs together, you know, and pile it up. And he'd keep burning for a week. We had that thing going. So what a blessing it is in a time of crisis that somebody steps in and says, here I am. I'm here. What do you need? How can I help you? And so today I want to talk about that because there are several people in the Bible that have that. And I can give you a lot of, uh, of examples, but I'm going to give you a few today. And uh, I want you to get it because the question is going to be, are we that type of person? If we see a need, do we want to meet it or do we want to run from it? Oh, that's just too much work for me or that's busy. I don't want to get involved, whatever. But let's take a look at some of the people and, and the times that they <clears throat> got in, in need. So... Here's uh, the people who said, basically, here I am. So today we're going to jump in a familiar passage of scripture in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. If you know, the prophet Isaiah had already, in the first five chapters, gave strong messages to Judah. But uh, we see something happen. And uh, follow me as we go in. And it was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each had six wings, with two <clears throat> they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies, and the whole earth is filled with, their glory, with his glory. The voice of their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. That's one of my prayers, that the presence of God would just fill this place with his glory. Amen? Uh, I believe it's coming in the name of Jesus. And then I, the, I, the problem is, if it's gory comes in, we'll see smoke, and we'll, somebody's going to holler fire, and you're going to run from it. So hang in here, all right, until we know for sure what it is. <laughs> Anyway, then he said, <clears throat> then I said, it's all over. I am doomed for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips. I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's army. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal and he said <clears throat> that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and he said, see, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> then I heard the Lord asking, whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Now, <clears throat> I want to just take a look at, at, uh, briefly at some of these people. Because it's interesting, in the time of need, in our time of grief and sorrow, in our time of grief and sorrow, here's what happens, is that God comes in and says, here I am. And this is what he did. If you'll notice, the king is, in the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was uh, Isaiah's cousin. And uh, he was the king. Isaiah was there as a prophet. They were in the, the, uh, uh, the, the palace. You know, life was good, even though there was hard messages. <clears throat> but now something happens. Circumstances change. His cousin is, has passed. And, uh, and here he is. He said, in the year that, I, that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And the point of heartbreak, the point of sorrow, when things get tough in our life, God is showing up, changing. There were, uh, things were changing, circumstances were different, a new king on the throne, and the Lord appears. And I want to tell you, when our hearts are broken, don't look for things of the world to comfort you. Look to Jesus. Amen? This is what he says, here I am. Yesterday we had Sylvia's service. Mike is here uh, with his daughter and son-in-law. What, what is it? Jesus shows up and says, I'm here to comfort. I'm here to move on your life. This is the time when we said instead of running to try to find things to comfort us, numb the pain, whatever, what God is saying is, I want you to come and say, here I am. Here I am in my need. Here I am transparent before you, God. Anybody relate to what, what's going on? We understand it. And then we see in our time of repentance, 
Here it's interesting that any time that you see the Lord and you see the holiness or you read the word or in your worship service and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit can come in. Anybody experience this on a Sunday morning? We're sitting there worshiping. Maybe the Holy Spirit goes, uh, you know, you need to forgive so-and-so for what they say. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm oh, oh, okay, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, whatever. What? You got into the presence of God, and holy God shows up and maybe shows some unholiness in your life. Isaiah did the same thing. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Even the angels were saying, holy, holy, holy. And when he sees a holy God, what does he see? He sees sin. Man, I got filthy lips. I, got, I don't know if he's eating wings or what, but I got filthy lips. I live among people with filthy lips. Man, it is, it is bad. What did he do? Here in the time of, of repentance, right? He said, it's all over. I'm doomed. In the midst of our grief, we become angry. We become uh, uh, bitter. You know, I mean, we, we, we find those things that happen in our life. We got to guard against it. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of filthy lips. And what happens? When God is convicting us, follow me, all right? Our old nature is we want to justify our sin. We want to just seal over, glaze over. Well, that's not that bad. Anybody relate to what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, it's not that bad. Yeah, but you're living together and you're living in sin. Yeah, but it's not that bad. No, it's sin. God's saying when that happens, listen to me. Here I am. Here I am. And this is exactly what he did. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm living with people with unclean lips. I have sin in my life. Here I am. Maybe this morning, that may be your situation. You have justified sin. You've not listened to it. You know, don't want to really hear from God because I got things to do and this is what I like and this is my pleasure. And God is saying, no, when you see my holiness and you see your sin, just confess. Let's repent. Let's change. Amen? There's a time when we say, here I am. The people said, amen. amen. We got to. When we're convicted of sin, don't run from God. Here's what happens. Forgiveness. And just like you said to the woman who was at, uh, caught in adultery, what did he say? I don't see any of your accusers. I'm not going to accuse you either, but here's the difference. Go and sin no more. There's got to be a change in your life. Don't keep doing what you're doing. Repentance is a turning away. And we come and Isaiah said, here I am. I am a man of unclean lips. And then, not only do we find in a time of grief and a time of repentance, but it's in our time of purpose. Purpose. God is looking for people. And he's saying, whom shall I send as a messenger? In these last days, we talked about it in class a while ago, we are last days missionaries. Whether you want to believe it or not, but this is what we are. These are the last days. I don't know how long it's going to be before Jesus comes. I don't know what we're going to have to go through, but we better be aware of it. We better get the mindset of it and say, I want to be a last days missionary. And God, whatever you call me to do, here I am. I'm ready to go. And so this is what God did. Why was it important? Because in the midst of his grief and in the midst of his repentance and recognizing sin in his life, not want him to forget about the purpose that God had for him. He had already been a prophet. Five chapters of, I mean, five, uh, yeah, chapters of messages of, of repentance for the nation. And what did he do? He said, in the middle of that, I don't want you to miss out on what I called you to do. Amen? Amen. This is the same thing with many of you. You maybe have let sin help you step back, you know, oh, I don't think I'm worthy, I'm not good enough, I can't, or maybe you got grief, maybe there's something else that's happening. Say, well, I don't know if it's time. In the midst of that, listen, do we grieve? Yes. Lisa's mom passed away in August. All right, we're still grieving over that. But in the midst of grief, in the midst of repentance, God is saying, I still have purpose for you. And we have to say, here I am, send me. Amen? That is where we need, every one of us, we need to be that. So we see it. He saw, uh, he saw the Lord in his holiness. He saw himself. And then he said, here, in the midst of all that, send me. The next one is Jacob. And I thought it was interesting because in Jacob's life, if you know about him, he's the grandson of Abraham. You have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, Isaac was his dad. He was a twin of Esau. And, um, and if you know the story at all, he was really a schemer. 
right? And so what he did was, with the help of his mother, he basically stole the birthright of, uh, of uh, Esau. Esau was the firstborn, and he also stole the blessing of the father. And so now his brother was really mad when he found out what happened. And so now he's running for his life. And he had already uh, had taken off, and he was going to go to his uncle Laban's house. All right, they're not from Arkansas; they just married same cousins and stuff. All right, all right. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry if you're from Arkansas. Anyway, so so what did he do? He takes off, but on his journey, he has a dream, and he sees this dream, and God's God makes uh, he makes a vow to God as God makes a vow to him. But look what happens with Jacob. Now he's in a situation; he's already gone; he's already seen. Uh, uh, how Laban, his uncle, was a schemer as well. And now he's got these two wives who were two sisters. And so he says, now God's going to reveal himself. And he says, then in my dream, this is Genesis 31, 11. He says, then in my dream, the angel of the Lord said to me, Jacob. And I replied, yes, here I am. I want you to follow this. He had already been schemed on. All right. He saw the, uh, Rachel, the, the beautiful sister, not saying the other one was ugly, but I'm just saying she was beautiful. He wanted that one, right? He worked seven years, right? For seven years, he worked for her. On the wedding night, what did he do? He goes in to consummate the, the marriage, and what does he do? He pulls the veil up. It's not her. Wait a minute, you know? And he goes back out, and he goes, hey, Uncle Laban, we got a problem here. I worked seven years for, the, for that one, and you sent this one. Yeah, but she's the older sister, you know, and she can't, you know, she got to be married before the other one. What? I don't even want to know. You know. He said, well, if you want the other one, work seven more years. So it was after this time that he's done this. So now he says, and in my dream, the angel of the Lord said to me, Jacob, and I replied, here I am, Lord. I am the, he said, I am the God who appeared to you at Bethel. This was the first dream. The place where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Now get ready. What is God doing? God is continuing to lead him. All right, now get ready uh, and leave this country and return to the land of your birth. Why is this important? Because in the time of our fear, listen to me, we can have grief, we can have repentance, we find our mission, but in the time of our fear, a lot of times we're running. Here it is, Abraham's grandson, Isaac's son, Jacob had deceived his father, he stole the birthright, all right? In the time of our fear is the time to say, here I am. Because when we understand where fear is coming from, right now there's a lot of things going on. We've had a global pandemic. We've got other things. We have mandates. We've got all kinds of stuff that's coming down the pipe. You see it every day on the news. And your life could be dominated by fear if you don't watch out. And God is saying right there in the midst of this, you come and say, Lord, here I am. I'm dealing with this thing called fear, but I understand that, what, perfect love casts out fear. Right? So let your perfect love dominate my life. Right? For God did not give me a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. We understand that in the midst of all that, we say, here I am. Don't run from it. Don't hide. But come to God and say, here I am. Let's deal with this situation. So that's what he did. He came to the Lord, and the Lord showed up in his dream. In the time of our uncertainty, anybody ever been there? Lost a job, Right? Don't know where to go, you know, mandates, you know, if you don't do this and you get fired, whatever, you know, some people have gone through that. Now, in this situation of uncertainty, so he, Jacob goes to his uncle's house, he finds his wife, or wives, all right, from his uncle, father-in-law now, who was a schemer, and now he, because God is blessing his life, he was over all the herds. But all of a sudden, there's so much prosperity going on. There's so many uh, herds, and I mean, it's double, tripled, it's quadrupled. And the Lord showed him how he could get his herd. And so what he did was, he said, this is how you can get spotted sheep, spotted goats, right? And so he goes to his uncle and said, listen, you keep all the ones that are a solid color, but if they have any spots on them, I'll keep those. He goes, sure, rare thing. Well, it just so happened that the majority of them started being spotted. His herd was a whole lot bigger. So now his brother-in-laws are mad at him. The family's mad at him. He's uncertain where to go. How am I going to do this now? Man, I got the whole family. I moved in. I'm living in their land. I'm living in, and uh, working with their pastures. It's a lot of uncertainty. In the days of uncertainty is when we say, here I am. I need guidance. If the Bible says if we lack wisdom, we'll give it to us liberally. In the days of your uncertainty, don't run from God. Don't try to figure it out yourself. Don't talk to everybody else. Now, there's wisdom and wise counsel, 
right? But man, you get with the word and you get on your knees and you talk to the Lord because you're going to need it, right? Jacob was living in their land. He was doing that. But he said, here I am. I need guidance in my life. And God says, I am sending you back home away from these people. God is going to give him deliverance. God will give you deliverance. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. Amen? Amen. And then we, we look in, in our time of blessing because God reminds him of the vow that Jacob had made. He said, do you remember that time when you were at Bethel? Well, let's go back to that time because he has this dream. And in uh, Genesis 28, verses 13 through 15 and 20 through 21, at the top of the stairway stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham and the God of your father Isaac. The ground, now he's going to lay out his, his uh, blessing upon his life. The ground that you're laying on belongs to you. I'm giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. Now, at this point, he's not even married. You get this? Let God sow a seed, a blessing in your life, and he may tell you something, but you're going, wait a minute, I'm not even married. <laughs> Stephanie wouldn't believe me. She came in one day, and we were talking. I said, you know, here's the situation. I, I believe that, that real soon you're going to get married. Oh, pastor, I'm not even dating anybody. And before the year was up, she was married. Boom, right? And then she comes in, and they weren't married that long, and I said, hey, God's going to give you children. No, Pastor, we're going to wait five years, and we're going to, boom, she's pregnant. All right? You see what happened? I'm not saying I'm a prophet, just God wanted to bless her life. Amen? And aren't you glad Olivia came? Amen and amen. Grandma and great-grandma ought to be saying some hallelujahs over there. All right? But well, this is what he said. He said, man, the, your descendants gonna be, uh, will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out all in all directions to the east, the west and the east, north and the south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, this is God's promise, I am with you. That may be the word that you need to hear today. God is saying to you, I am with you. I'm with you. You're not alone. You'll never be alone. I am with you, and I will protect you wherever you go. One day I will bring you back to this land, and this is what he did. And then later we see this other verse. I will not leave you until I finish giving you everything I promised you. And then Jacob made this vow. Once he heard the promises of God, then he comes back. When you start reading the word of God and you get to know Jesus, in a personal way, not about Jesus. No, you know Jesus. You get up in the morning, you're talking to him. You know him, right? And so he said, then Jacob made the vow, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, just the basic needs, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. What did he do? He made a vow. If you're going to do that, I'll follow you, Right? And not only just did he have food and clothing, he came back with a huge herd of livestock. He, he came back a wealthy man, right? God bless it. This isn't the health and wealth prosperity message. It's just a blessing message, okay? Don't, don't put me in any category. I'm just reading the word, okay? So God promised him land, generations of descendants, kings, protection, uh, food, clothing, and his presence. God also changes his name to Israel, right? You know what God will do for you? He'll change your name. He'll change the reputation that you had in the past. All right? You know what I'm saying? Some of you Frank the Tank, but now you're Jesus. Is, hold on. Hello. <clears throat> Some of you may get that. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Who's Frank? <clears throat> anyway, but he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. He's not a schemer anymore, but he's one who contends with God. And Jacob's reply is, here I am. Let's do this. And then it goes on, I had to put this in here, because in all of his life, God had a blessing upon him, right? Second born, but God changed that, gave him the father's blessing, gave him the, the, the birthright, he gave him all of that, blessed him when he was over at Uncle Laban's house, protected him. He later had an encounter with his brother, but things had cooled off, and so they were fine with each other. All of that was good, Right? Now he comes back, you remember the story, he has the 12 sons, which are the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And we'll see that the youngest brother, remember he had two wives, well, one of the wives that he loved the most finally had a son named Joseph, if you know those stories about Joseph. The brothers didn't like him, and they sold him into slavery, told his dad that he had died, so Jacob is suffering, right? 
and he's grieving over his favorite son. He gave him a coat of many colors. You remember those stories if you grew up. So now he finds out Joseph is in Egypt, and here is another dream. So Jacob set out for Egypt with all his possessions, and then when he came to Beersheba, uh, he offered sacrifices to God his father Isaac during the night. God spoke to him in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, now here's the relationship. He, cut, he said, here I am. Here I am. He had already had him in a dream and saw the stairways. He, he already heard from him whenever he was over in with Uncle Laban, and now he's come back. And here he is again, and he's going in because God has provided through Joseph an interpretation of a dream, the, the salvation from a famine that was hitting the land. He said, I'll protect you. And so now he's going to go in. He says, here I am. And then uh, Jacob replied, I am the God, the God of your father, the voice said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make your family into a great nation. They were there for over 400 years. They, they multiplied like crazy. That's why the, the Egyptians made them slaves, right? Moses is the one that brought them out, if you remember that story. So now he sees his, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make your family into a great nation. I'll go with you down to Egypt, and I will bring you back again. And listen, listen to what he said. He goes all the way to this. You will die in Egypt. But Joseph, your favorite son that you missed all these years, Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. Here I am, Lord. God knows our future. He knew Jay. He said, Jacob, you're going to Egypt. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bring them out. They're going to take over the promised land that I promised you when you laid there the first time. He said, I'm going to give you the land that you're laying on. They're going to come out. He said, you're going to die in Egypt, but Joseph, your favorite son, the one who thought you thought was dead for a long time, he's going to be with you. That's the kind of God that we can come to him and say, I'm here. In uncertainty, in grief, in fear, and even in the midst of blessing, God, I'm still here. I'm not going to take my blessing and say, okay, God, thanks a bunch for blessing me, and then walk off. All right? For every 100 people who can handle adversity, only one can handle prosperity. It messes with you. It makes you greedy if you don't guard your heart. Here's what happens. So that's Jacob. And then we move to, to Samuel real quick. How are we doing? So Samuel. Let's begin First Samuel 3, 3, 11. It said, The lamp of, of, of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Now let me just give you a little background. He, Samuel, if you begin with the first chapter, Samuel was the, the son of Elkanah and Hannah. And uh, Elkanah had two wives, and um, one of them was very fertile. She had a bunch of kids from uh, Elkanah. He was, he was there, you know, and having babies. Hannah was barren. And every year they would go to the temple, and they would worship and everything. And uh, Panina uh, is, uh, Panini is, uh, let's see, uh, it's Panina. She would uh, mock Hannah, because she wouldn't have any babies. And here she was, she got all her kids, and these are Elkin's kids, and we're all coming here, and she had to go by herself. And it was one time that they were there, and Hannah was weeping before the Lord. And the high priest, Eli, saw her, and he thought, you know, is this woman drunk because she saw her lips moving, and she was upset. And so he came, and he said, hey, you're not supposed to be here causing trouble. And he goes, she goes, no, I'm, I'm not drunk. I'm, my heart's broken. I've been barren. And so... You know, I'm, I'm praying that God will give me a child. And God laid it on Eli's heart. He said, hey, this time next year, you're going to have a child. And she promised God, if you will give me a son, I will give him back to you to serve. Right? So now we pick up. And he grew, right? And she weaned him, and he grew. And as, as a young child and as a boy, he's now in there. And here he's probably a young teenager, and he's already serving back with Eli in the temple. And here's what happens. It says, The lamp of God had not yet gone out, but Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes. Samuel replied, well, What is it? He got up and he ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. And then the Lord called out again, Samuel. 
He, and again, Samuel got up. He went into Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son. Eli said, go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know that the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, and once more Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized, you know he was in a deep sleep because he wasn't getting it. He, Eli realized it was the Lord was... Uh, was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. This is a great time. If you're in bed or if you're listening, you're to quiet time with the Lord and you hear some speak, Lord, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed and the Lord came and he called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replies, speak, your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, I'm about to do a shocking thing in Israel. Oh, it was going to be pretty incredible. How about your first message, message getting something like that? All right? And it was actually going to be about Eli and his family, the very one you're serving. Right? So in our time of youth, young in the faith, and in our influence of godly parents or leaders, we're supposed to say, here I am. So we see that he, he was this child, and, and Hannah, she fulfilled her promise. She gave him back to the Lord, and he was serving. And I got to tell you, you, we have a time of dedication up here. We dedicate our babies. We don't baptize, but we dedicate. But with every one of our sons, you know what we did? We laid our hands on them and we dedicated them to the Lord. You know, even when Lisa was pregnant. And uh, we laid our hands. And we, and we didn't know what, what they were, but we want to dedicate them to the Lord. Maybe you've done the same thing. God wants to do something in our children, our sons and our daughters for this next generation. God wants to raise them up as mighty men and women of God, right? We dedicated, Hannah dedicated her son, and God used him. God gave him ears to hear, gave him a mouth. He was a mouthpiece for God, and, uh, and you'll see in his life when he went through. And so in our time of dedication, right, here they are, Lord. Use them. If you haven't done that with your children, do it. I'm believing the best is yet to come for all three of my sons. And in our time of obedience and service, when Samuel heard the voice, he immediately responded, Speak, Lord, your servant is speaking. My question is, how do we respond when God speaks to us? Maybe he's already spoke to you this morning, whether through the worship or through a scripture. How are you going to respond? Are you going to say, here I am? He was given the word from the Lord, and I'm telling you, when Eli came the, the next morning, he said, did God speak to you? Yes, you better tell me exactly what he said. And it was a hard word, but you know what? He obediently told him everything that the Lord has said. And it was a hard word. You can read it for yourself. We're moving on. Anyway, so young Sam said, here I am. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, I'm going to do it. And you know what? God did the rest. God used Samuel, this young boy who was dedicated to the Lord, that when the nation who was supposed to be following God came along and said, we want a king. And he preached against them. He said, you don't, want to, you don't need a king. God is your God. He is your king. And you know what he did? They, they, they still went against him, but he, he anointed Saul as king, and then he anointed David as king, and he gave them a powerful word. God wants to use you in the same way. He wants to speak to you, and he wants you to repeat what he says. Amen? Amen. Some of you are going to get that. It's, it's the word of the Lord. Then we come to uh, Abraham real quick, and we're going to move through. Abraham had already, uh, you know, God had used him. He's going to be the, the leader of a nation. And, I, and I, I picked this verse because I don't know what everybody is going through, but some of you may be going through some really tough times. And so we know the story of Abraham. He was old in his, in his age. His wife, Sarah, was old. And uh, the angel of the Lord came and said, hey, guess, guess what? You're going to you're going to have a child, you know, and you're going to be the father of a nation. And they're like, yeah, we're really old. That's not going to happen. No, it's going to happen. So they believed God. It was their faith of Abraham that they believed God. So now they have the son, Isaac, right? And so they are rejoicing over it. It was a miracle. Everybody knew it was a miracle because these old people are not supposed to have babies. I mean, it was 90s and he was 100 years old. The dad was when it happened. And it was awesome. Anyway, but look at the challenge. I want you to, this is for somebody today. Look what it says, Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. And I'm going to tell you, God will test your faith. He does it because he loves us. But he, he does it so that we, all, all of you students that are in high school, we, we went through school, what do we have? Tests to see if we're making progress. God will give us tests to see if we're growing and maturing in our faith. Right? 
that if some, you know, something bad happens or if there's some little deal that, oh, we don't like this, or I got a scratch on my car or my nail popped off and blah, 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 you know, grow up. That's what he's saying, grow up. Okay, so, so here it is. He, he, he calls to Abraham and it's God called, yes, he replied. What did he say? Here I am. Take your son. Now get this, the promised son. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much. God put that in there. Go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him. What? Wait, wait a minute. I waited. You told me, gave me a message. I waited another 10 years. I finally got him here, and I love this kid. And what? You, wait, wait, wait. Did you say, yeah, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of your, one of your mountains, one of which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey, he took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering, and he set, set out for the place God had told him about. In our most difficult challenges, God is wanting us to say, here I am. Whatever you're challenging me, whatever test that I have to go through, you're going to go through it with me. You're going to be my strength. You're going to be my comfort. But you're going to go through it. Look at what, look what happens. God will put us to the test. The question is, are we ready? They're not easy. Go sacrifice your son. Your only son is a sacrifice. Listen to us. Go start a church. Leaves us the security of a job and go start a church. I'm going to be with you. Well, let me tell you, that's not as hard as him saying, go sacrifice your son. And God's with us. Amen? Amen. We're sitting here today because God said, go do something. And we, we just believe that here I am. You'll do it. We can't. But you will. In our times to obey when we cannot see the future. Abraham got up early, he saddled his donkey, here I am, he even chopped wood. How would you like experiencing this, chopping wood and knowing that the wood that you're gathering is going to be set on fire, then that fire is going to burn your son? You don't think there was something going along in, in, in Abraham's life and in his thoughts? You're like, oh man, what is this? He had to process it, right? I'm doing this, I'm sacrificing my son because God told me to, and I have to believe he will bring him back to life again. And God gave him to me with a promise that our descendants will be like the stars in the sky. That's what he had to deal with. And in Hebrews, we see it. In Hebrews 11, 17 through 15, 19, and it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promise, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. Obedience in the pain of uncertainty. Have you gone through that? Some of you are going through that right now. Uncertainty. It's here. We all have. Maybe that's where you are right now. You're going through those seasons. God did not allow Abraham to sacrifice his son, but you know what was interesting of in this? That on that same spot that he was going to sacrifice his son, 1,800 years later, that area became the city of Jerusalem. 1,800 years later, and, and archaeologists believe that on the same mount where he was was the same place that God's son was sacrificed. 1,800 years later. And Jesus said, here I am. And then we'll end with Jesus because that's where we start with. He's always with us in every situation, especially the tough ones. And that may be where you are. So let me tell you the story, and we're, we're going to be through. In John 6, 18 through 21, this is what happened. Jesus has already fed 5,000, and then soon here he sent his disciples away. They're in the boat, and then soon a gale swept down upon them, and the sea grew very rough. And they had rowed three or, four, rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, Don't be afraid. I am here. Then they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived to their destination. Ever been in a storm? Rode out a hurricane? Been in an earthquake? Lisa and I were in an earthquake in San Francisco, October 17th. 
been in an emotional storm, storm in your marriage, in your life, were you scared? Then you begin to feel what they were feeling. They rode in the midst of a storm. Sometimes God will delay his rescue. Sometimes God will let you row. And if you think about rowing in the rough seas for three or four miles, then he comes. Maybe he has to get us to the end of ourself. And then he comes in and he shows up. Don't be afraid. Maybe that's where you're at. Don't be afraid. I'm here. I'm here. Some of you need to get that. I'm here. That's what Jesus is saying for you. I'm here. And I liked it. They said they couldn't wait to get him in the boat. All right, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Help us. And then the storm ceases. Jesus is here. He'll never fail us. Let me give you some promises. Write these down because you may need them this week. Matthew 28, 20. He said, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Then Jesus is here, and he's ready to respond. I love this, this story. In Isaiah 65, 1, it says, The Lord says, I was ready to respond, but no one asked for help. You ready to ask? Look what he said. No one asked for help. I was ready to be found, but no one was looking for me. I said, here I am. Here I am. God may be telling some of you, you're saying, oh, I've got this addiction. I've got this problem. I've got all these this issues going on in my life. And he said, I'm here. I am right here waiting on you. Amen. I want to respond to you. You just don't even ask me. Today you need to ask. You getting it? He's not way out there. He's here. Yeah. I'm here. I love you. I created you. I know you. I know that number of hairs on your head. I know everything about you. I know what you're doing. I know what your struggle is. And I'm here and I'm ready to help you. I am here. He said that to a nation that did not call on my name. Boy, our nation needs Jesus, doesn't it? Come on. I'm here offering my help. And I love this. Jesus is here holding our right hand. Oh, it's going to get personal now. Look what it says in Psalm 41, 13. For I hold you by your right hand, I, the Lord your God. And I say to you, don't be afraid. I am here to help you. Have you ever driven? I, I, I had to take a drive the other day. Well, actually, I did it again yesterday. On the way to the cemetery, I just put my hand over there. Just held the hand of Jesus. That's how personal he is. He just wants to hold your hand. You know why? He wants you to recognize, you to recognize that, one, you believe in who he is. And you recognize his presence that he will never leave you or forsake you. You know, some of you just need to drive along in the car. Hold his hand. He's right there. Don't be afraid. I'm right here with you. That is a great time to share your heart with God. Right? Hold out your hand. I'm comforting you. I'm leading you. I'm forgiving you. I'm saving you. Don't be afraid. I'm here to help you. Philippians 4, 19, it says this, And the same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Jesus is saying, I'm here. Well, let me ask this. When he calls us to win souls and make disciples, we went over evangelism this morning in our class. When he says, hey, there's someone you need to witness to, there's some family members, you, you know, are you ones going, here I am. Or do we run the other way? Mm -mm. They're going to make fun of me. They'll reject me. God needs people to say, here I am. This church needs to be full of people who say, God, here I am. In my grief, in my sorrow, in my fear, in my sin, in every situation possible, God, I'm here. And I know you're here. I know you love me. I know with your help, I can repent of my sin. 
I can allow the power that raised Jesus from the dead to flow through me. I'm holding your hand right now. That is who he is. It is not a religion. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. We need a church full of disciples who will say, put me in, coach. All right? Can I say this? I'm, I'm going to just, just brag. Yesterday we had the service. We went over there to eat some delicious food, by the way. That was good food. But I was so proud of our ladies and uh, some of our men who were over there who helped serve the food at Sylvia's service. It was awesome. And I've got to tell you, as a, as a pastor, to walk in the fellowship hall, see all those beautiful faces, and, man, they're all lined up, and they got their aprons on with, what, Yahweh servants, or, you know, and they got you named. I mean, I'm looking at it. Y'all, that blessed me. That blessed me. You know why? Because our hearts are broke. We needed a blessing, right? I try, you know, to get up here and go, go through the service, but I, I kind of cracked yesterday. I wouldn't do it too good. Heart's broke. What a blessing you are. You know why? Because there's some women in our church that said, here I am. I'll serve. I'll make tamales. I'll serve that chicken and that barbecue and everything else, and I'll wash those dishes, and I'll do whatever. You know what that... Let's be in the hands and feet of Jesus. You know, Mike had a whole, you know what they saw? They saw the hands and feet of Jesus standing there serving. That blessed me. I'm telling you, we need it. This coming Wednesday night, we're going to be having a fall festival. And let me say, as a pastor, we do not celebrate Halloween. I will just tell you, we do not. That is a high unholy day of, of Satan. We don't. But we'll have a fall festival at time. So saying that, don't bring your kids up here dressed like a witch or a ghost or a zombie, all right? Don't do that. You know, they can be a duck or whatever, you know, something. But don't, don't go on the dark side, okay? But how about showing up? Yeah. Say, I'm here, yeah. right? I'll hear. Y'all Y'all need some help? Man, they're going to need help with the booths and whatever. I'm here. Be that person. I'm here, all right? We got an opportunity. No matter what we're going through. Jesus is saying, I'm here. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. And I want it to get real, real personal. What is it that you're going through? Okay, don't, don't miss this moment. Don't miss it. What is it that you're going through? It may, it may be marriage. It may be finances. It may be children. It, whatever. It may be your job. Whatever it is. Maybe depression. Jesus is saying to you, I'm here. What he wants to hear from you is, I'm here too. I'm here. Come on. I'm here. This is what you need. Have that encounter with Jesus right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't want anybody looking around. I don't want anybody leaving. I want you just to wait. I want you to focus. Because I want you to have an encounter with Jesus today. He's saying, I'm here. I'm here to help you. I'm here to forgive you. I'm here to heal you. I'm here to deliver you. I'm here. I'm here to love on you. You feel lonely? I'm here. Scared? I'm here. Those disciples were scared too, but I, I met them right there. I'm here. Talk to him. Be transparent with him. Maybe it's been a while. Maybe there's sin in your life and you know it. Maybe you just need to confess it. Change. I'm here. Maybe you need salvation. God, I'm here. Save me. But right now is your time to talk to him. Right where you are. From your heart to Jesus' heart. He knows your thoughts. The Bible says he knows our thoughts from afar, from way off. He already knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going to think even before you think it. Talk to him. Lord, I'm uncertain about the future. Things have changed in my life. I don't know what's going to happen, but here I am. And here you are. Help me. Hold my hand. Maybe you just need to turn your right hand uh, over and say, hold my hand. Get me through these next days and weeks and months. 
Things are changing. I'm uncertain about it all. Whatever it may be. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, He's here to save you. But it's an encounter with Jesus that you need to have. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're lost today, I want to pray for you. And I just ask that you would just raise your hand. Nobody looking around, just raise your hand. Say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to get this right. I want Jesus to save me. If that's you, I want you just to raise your hand. Say, pray for me. Maybe somebody who's at home, you're struggling with some things. Maybe fear. Maybe that's why you hadn't come back yet. Talk to him. He's there, right there in your living room, your bedroom, wherever you are, in your car, whatever it may be. Talk to him. But right now, you can understand that we all need a Savior. Every single one of us, we all need salvation. The Bible says that we would confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That any man and woman who's in Christ, they become a new creation. The old things are passed away. All things become new in our life. We need Jesus. We need to stop whatever it is that's destroying our life. We need to stop sinning. Quit justifying it. Let's start new today. Let's start. So right where you are, church family, pray along. With these who maybe for the first time want to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let's pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I have sinned against you, and I'm sorry. I repent of my sin. I turn from my wicked ways. I turn to you, Jesus. I open the door to my heart. I invite you to come in. Forgive me of all my sin. Wash me clean with your precious blood. Save my soul. Give me eternal life. Baptize me in the power of your Holy Spirit so I may live for you, serve you, obey your word, love you all the days of my life. I ask in faith, and I believe in my heart that you, Jesus, rose again on the third day so that I could be saved today. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. You are my Lord. You are my God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to thank you so much for being a part of our online streaming. I hope you really enjoyed the message today. And I want you to just take it to heart. Whatever the Lord has spoken to you, just take it to heart. And and I pray that if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today would be that day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. So that's what we're praying for you. And if you're wondering, how do I get to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior? Well, let me tell you, it's pretty simple. First of all, Jesus loves you more than anybody on this planet. So let me tell you, he's wanting you to know him. So as you come to him, we recognize one that we've sinned against God. Everybody has. The Bible says that all have sinned. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Well, we recognize that one. We don't have to be told that. We know that. The second thing is, it says that God demonstrated his love for us, and that's you. God loves you even though that we were sinners. That's how much he cares for you. So you got to get it out of the way. He's not judging you. He already sent his son to die in our place so that we could have all of our sin placed upon him. And then we believe we had faith in him that that's what he did, and he did it because he loved us. The Bible says the wages of our sin is death. Well, Jesus took our death sentence for us, but then it doesn't leave it as a negative. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. It's not works. It's not a, a church membership somewhere. It's not giving money to somebody. All of those are good things, but this not, does not bring salvation. So now, how do you get there? It's only in Jesus. So simply just open your heart and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me. I want to turn away from all the stupid stuff that I'm doing. And I want to turn to you. I want you to be my Lord, my Savior, the boss of my life. And Jesus, come in and save me. I want to love you. I want to live for you. I want to obey your word all the days of my life. And that's what you can do. Pray that prayer right now. And I'll tell you, Jesus is waiting. And the moment, the instant you do that, you will be saved. And my encouragement to you, 
Find a great Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. Get connected. Now, if you're in the Houston area, man, we would love to have you at Fellowship of the Nations. But you're in different parts of the country or even around the world. Find somewhere that they're preaching Jesus. And I promise you, it will change your life. Hope you can join us again next week. And uh, up until then, we'll be praying for you. Pray for us. We'd love to hear from you. Just go on our website, FOTN.org, Fellowship of the Nations, and let us hear from you. God bless you.